Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, what should be the uh, final lecture for the class. Uh, following this lecture, uh, you will take your final exam. Anyway, so uh, let's uh, begin our lecture where we left off last time. Uh, last time we talked about uh, the uh, Section B under government and economy. Today we continue with Section C and D. So let's start with Section C, Rights and Liberties, 1945 to 1978. Write it down. Uh, during this period, during this period, the Supreme Court was preoccupied with expanding the rights and liberties of individuals in the United States. That was the major uh, preoccupation of the court. Uh, the court was very liberal, was a liberal court. And uh, the first major case on rights and liberties was, as you can see here, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. So what is Brown versus Board of Education? Write it down. Brown versus Board of Education was a combination of four cases, four cases, all of them under the heading of Brown, all of them dealing with segregation. Okay, all of the cases deal, dealt with segregation. All the cases claimed that segregation violated the 14th Amendment Clause to equal protection under the law. So a violation of equal protection under the law. Did the Supreme Court agree? Yes, it did by a unanimous decision, nine to zero, the Supreme Court agreed that segregation is unconstitutional and ordered states to desegregate their facilities immediately. All right? Now, why is this case considered important why is it taught in almost every american government class this case is important because it is a precedent setting case precedent p r e c e d e n t precedent setting case now, what is a precedent-setting case? A precedent-setting case is one of such importance, such magnitude, that all future cases are decided upon it. All right? So basically, this case said, the first case that said that segregation is unconstitutional. All right? It's a precedent. So in the future, if there are other cases that deal with segregation, they will be decided on the basis of Brown. Got it? Let's continue. So that means that before Brown, there was a case that gave legitimacy to segregation. What was that case? That case is, as you can see, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. All right? Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. So what was that case about? Write it down. Plessy was one-eighth black and seven-eighths white, 
okay? Back then, if you were one-eighth black, you were considered black. That was the racial uh, segregation system at that time. So Plessy purchases a first-class train ticket in the state of Louisiana, okay? At that time, Louisiana segregated its trains into white-only and colored-only sections. White-only and colored-only section. But Plessy decides to sit in the white section. Why? Because he believes he's white, seven-eighths white. He is asked to leave to the colored section. He refuses and is arrested and put on trial in Judge Ferguson's court, and he goes to jail. From jail, he appeals all the way to the Supreme Court, claiming, in part, that segregation violates equal protection under the law. The same claim that was made 48 years later under Brown. Okay? However, this time, the result is different. The court disagrees with Plessy, saying, although the facilities are segregated, although the facilities are segregated, they are still equally provided. So, yeah. They are separate, but they are equally provided. And now you have the birth of this doctrine called separate but equal. Separate but equal. This doctrine gave legitimacy to segregation all the way until 1954. So from 1896 until 1954, separate but equal was the doctrine that legitimized segregation. So the question is here, what changed? 1896, they decide one way. 1954, they decide a completely different way. What changed? The Constitution didn't change, that's for sure. It's the same 14th Amendment. What changed are the judges. Back then, in 1896, judges were openly racist, and they did not mind being racist. By 1954, and in the middle of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, the United States, at least officially, could no longer be racist. And judges became less likely to be racist. And therefore, the judges' values changed. In 1896, they had racist values, by 1954, they could not be as openly racist as they were. So, once again, we see that you change the values of the judges, you change the decisions of the judges, just like I told you when we opened this section. Next case we're going to talk about in the list is the the case of Gideon versus Wainwright from 1963. 
Okay? Who was Gideon? Gideon was a drifter, a bum, a man out on his luck. Okay? While he was drifting in Florida, he allegedly breaks into a bar and steals stuff. Okay? He is arrested by the police in Florida and he asks for a lawyer. But Florida law does not allow lawyers in such cases. Okay? He defends himself as best he can in court and he loses and goes to jail. From jail, he appeals all the way uh, to the Supreme Court. All the way to the Supreme Court. He says, he says, two of his rights have been violated. Number one, the right to a counsel under the Sixth Amendment. They didn't give him one. And number two, his 14th Amendment right to due process under the law. Okay? The Supreme Court agrees and orders him a new trial where he is acquitted of that alleged crime. Now, again, why is this case important? It is important because it's a precedent-setting case. Write it down. This case was the first time that the federal courts federal courts forced states to apply the federal bill of rights you know the 10 amendments states before that used to say well this right is not in our constitution so we're not going to apply it after this decision, after this decision, states could no longer say so. If these rights are in the federal constitution, they are automatically in the state constitution. This is huge. In other words, civil rights and liberties became a federal issue no longer a state issue very important precedent next up miranda versus arizona in 1966 you probably heard of miranda rights right when someone is arrested they are supposed to be read their miranda rights Okay, you have the right to remain silent. Uh, anything you can say can be used against you in court. You have the right for an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. All right, Miranda rights. You've seen it on TV multiple times. So your job is this. Find out on your own find out on your own what this case was about and how it led to Miranda rights. Next up, next case I'm going to talk about is Roe versus Wade, 1973. 
again, very familiar case, and perhaps the most controversial case that the Supreme Court has decided. This case deals with abortion. Write it down. Roe is the fake name of a woman who was pregnant in the state of Texas. Pregnant in the state of Texas. She wanted to have an abortion. At that time, Texas only allowed abortions if the life of the mother was in danger. So, she sues the district attorney of Dallas County in order to get an abortion. Upon multiple appeals through state court and through federal court, the case goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decides the following. First, it breaks abortion, sorry, it breaks pregnancy into three trimesters, three trimesters. During the first trimester, no state shall deny a woman the right to have an abortion. In fact, almost 90% of abortions occur during the first trimester of pregnancy when the fetus is not viable. Viable means it cannot survive outside the womb even in an incubator. Okay, so during the first trimester, Supreme Court says a woman wants to have an abortion, she should be allowed to have an abortion. During the second trimester, the third and sixth month of pregnancy, states can restrict abortion rights States can restrict abortion rights, but they cannot prohibit them. They can put restrictions on the right to have an abortion. And finally, during the last three months of pregnancy, the final trimester, the state can prohibit abortion entirely. Okay? Now, this decision had to be decided on something in the Constitution. Basically, somewhere in the Constitution, they had to find the right to have an abortion. The Constitution speaks with a male voice. It doesn't mention women. It doesn't mention abortion. So where did the judges find the right to have an abortion? Write it down. <clears throat> the Ninth Amendment states that there are certain rights that people have that are not listed in the Constitution. Okay? Certain rights that people have that are not listed in the Constitution. Call it a catch-all amendment. Call it uh, the Founding Fathers uh, covering every eventuality by putting this amendment in there. All right. 
the Supreme Court said there is an implied right to privacy in the Constitution. You have the right to privacy. And the right to privacy extends to controlling the content of your body and therefore the right to have an abortion. Okay? I am in favor of a woman's right to choose. However, this decision is very weak. Constitutionally, it's very weak. And therefore, it became a huge target when the Supreme Court started turning more and more conservative. Which brings us to D, conservative court, 1980 to the present. All right. So let's talk about <clears throat> the conservative court from 1980 to the present. Write it down. <clears throat> Ronald Reagan, Bush the father, Bush the son, and Donald Trump appointed highly conservative, religious, and young judges to the Supreme Court and to the courts in general. Okay? Today, the Supreme Court is conservative by a six to three majority. It used to be five to four. There was the recent death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Donald Trump got to appoint a third conservative judge in only one term in office. So now it is six to three conservative to liberals. So what did the court, this conservative court, want to do? First, it wanted to limit and roll back the expansion of civil rights and liberties. Limit and roll back the expansion of civil rights and liberties. Second, it wanted to empower the executive branch at the expense of the legislative branch. And third, it wanted to empower corporate America, bring back the era of corporate dominance, roll back the New Deal legislations. Okay? that were enacted under FDR. So bring back the era that was dominant from 1860 until 1932. So let's talk about their court cases. Their biggest target, their biggest target, has been Roe versus Wade, the abortion decision. In several cases, in several cases, the conservative court has allowed restrictions on abortion. Okay? I will give you 
three such cases. Number one, the Supreme Court said that it is constitutional to deny government funding to abortion clinics, whether that is federal funding or state funding. The practical application here is this. If you are poor and you want to have an abortion, you will not afford to have an abortion if your abortion clinic is not funded. And so, you are poor and you are pregnant and you have the child, the likelihood of you living in poverty for the rest of your life climbs exponentially. All right? By the way, this is not applicable in California because California, the state of California, the California government, fully funds its abortion clinics. Number two, it was deemed constitutional that doctors and hospitals must notify parents that their minor daughter is having an abortion. These are known as parental notification laws. Again, not applicable in California. We do not have parental notification laws when it comes to abortion. And finally, in 2007, 2007, the Supreme Court upheld a federal ban on a late-term abortion procedure, late-term abortion procedure known as partial birth abortion. Okay? However, they kept it if the life of the mother is in danger. We know, we know that roughly 95 to 97% of pregnancies are terminated during the first and second trimesters. So this did not have much of an impact. Partial birth abortions are usually practiced when the life of the mother is in danger anyway. So, now that the court is six to three conservative, I predict that there will be a case soon originating from one of the red states that makes it to the Supreme Court on the issue of the constitutionality of abortion. The Supreme Court would decide to reverse Roe versus Wade and allow each state to decide their own abortion laws. Okay? So, in state like California, nothing will happen. Women will continue to enjoy the right of choice. In fact, in California, we have more abortion rights protection than federal law allows. So we go beyond federal law. In other states, red states, conservative states like Alabama, like Utah, these states will probably ban abortion altogether or restricted to a very minimal level. That is my prediction now that the court has a strong conservative majority. All right. Next case. 
Number two, U.S. versus Pitain. All right? U.S. versus Pitain. In 2004, the Supreme Court agreed by a 5 to 4 decision, 5 conservative against 4 liberals, that physical evidence obtained from an unmirandized statement, someone who wasn't read his Miranda rights, is constitutionally admissible in court. Okay? So, here's how this came about. Petain is an ex-felon. Petain had a girlfriend. He broke up with her and she took a restraining order against him. All right? So Petain, because he is dumb, kept calling his ex-girlfriend in violation of the restraining order. The police came to his house to arrest him. Okay? He's violating the restraining order. The police were reading him his rights, but they stopped when he told them that he knows his rights. He stopped. Thereafter, he tells the police that he has a gun. As an ex-felon, Petain was not permitted to possess a gun and was prosecuted for an illegal possession of a firearm. You understand what happened here? So the implication here is Never waive your right, your Miranda rights, when you are getting arrested. Always insist that the police read you your Miranda rights if they are arresting you. Always ask, are you arresting me? If the police says yes, tell them, please read me my Miranda rights. That's all you have to say. Here's another case. Hudson versus Michigan from 2006. Again, it was a five to four decision. Five conservatives against four liberals. This decision allowed a search warrant to be executed without knocking and announcing. Now, why is this dangerous? Why does not knocking and announcing, why is that dangerous behavior by the police? Let me give you the following hypothetical. I just made up this story. I am here in my apartment, and my next door neighbor is in his apartment. I am apartment three, he is apartment two. Let's say, furthermore, for the sake of argument, that he is a drug dealer and I am a gun lover. 
I collect guns. I have multiple of them on my couch, on my coffee table, on my kitchen table, in my bed. I sleep with a gun under my pillow, right? Let's just say that I love guns. I have so many of them, 14, 15, 20 guns, right? He's a drug dealer. The police, every time they get a search warrant and they knock and announce, that was before Hudson versus Michigan, they knock and announce, he has a method of getting rid of all the drugs in his apartment. They find no evidence. They know he's a drug dealer, but they find no evidence. All right? Now the case of Hudson versus Michigan is the law, federal law. The police go out again and get a search warrant. But now, rather than put apartment two on the address, they accidentally put apartment three on the address, my apartment. And they come to my door without knocking and announcing. Remember, I have guns all over the place. And they barge right in through the door. I have guns. I shoot back at them. They shoot back at me. I am dead. Many of them are dead. And the guy in apartment number two still gets rid of the drugs and they do not catch him. We knock and announce because it is safe for the police and safe for the occupant of that residence that we are knocking and announcing on. It's very important to knock and announce. Finally, final case, Citizens United versus FEC. In 2010, in this case, the Supreme Court reaffirmed the concept of corporate personhood. Remember Santa Clara County versus Southern Railroad? They reaffirmed that case by allowing corporations to spend unlimited amounts of money on election campaigns in the form of independent expenditures. Look up what independent expenditures from previous lectures. In the form of independent expenditures. Prior to that decision, <clears throat> corporations could not spend money directly. They could only spend money through political action commissions, committees, I'm sorry, political action committees. <clears throat> so as you can see with these cases, <clears throat> the Supreme Court is slowly rolling back slowly but surely rolling back civil rights and liberties, empowering the executive branch, and empowering corporations. And that brings us to Roman numeral three, the federal court system in the United States.
All right, so Roman numeral three, I just pulled up a chart uh, that you can see next to my uh, video. And uh, which will tell us how the United States federal court system looks like. Write it down. The United States federal court system has three layers. Three layers. Starting at the bottom and going to the top. A, you have the U.S. district courts. U.S. district courts. There are 94 such courts, 94 such courts. These are courts of original jurisdiction, original jurisdictions, meaning they are the first court to hear a case, first court to hear a case. They hear cases that involve a violation of federal law. So what are the cases that involve a violation of federal law? Civil rights violations, environmental law violations, postal service violations, kidnapping violations, counterfeiting violations, drug trafficking violations, okay? These are trial courts. You have a judge, you have lawyers on each side, you have a jury of 12, evidence is presented, Witnesses take the stand, and then a decision is made. Okay? Clear? So that is the first and bottom layer. 94 such courts. Next up, the next layer, are the U.S. Courts of Appeal. U.S. Courts of Appeal. These Courts of Appeal are appellate courts. They hear cases on appeal, on appeal from lower district courts. Okay? They are also regional courts. They are also regional courts, meaning they hear cases on appeal from a district court located in the region of the United States. Let me show you. If you look at these uh, courts of appeals, also known as circuit courts, you will notice that there are uh, 11 of them. There's actually 12 of them. One is not in there. Uh, it's a copyright uh, court. But you will notice that each one of them hears cases from a region of the United States. Okay? Uh, for example, the 10th Circuit Courts hears cases from Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Kansas, and Oklahoma, all right? The Ninth Circuit Court, here's cases from Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, California, Nevada, Arizona, uh, Alaska, Hawaii, and uh, some of the American territories, okay? The Fifth Circuit Court, here's cases from Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. So they are regional courts. They hear cases from a region within the United States. 
these cases, these courts, sorry, hear cases that involve an alleged violation of a person's rights under the Constitution. Okay? So let's continue with the story about my neighbor being a drug dealer. All right? Let's just continue along this line. Of course, he's not. I'm just being hypothetical here. So let's say, eventually, the police find evidence and they capture him for drug dealing and he goes to trial at a district court at the very bottom. However, his lawyer is incompetent and his lawyer is caught napping during the presentation of the evidence against his client. Is this appealable to a circuit court, a court of appeals? Well, the answer is yes, it is appealable because two things are being violated. His right to a competent attorney is being violated and his right to due process is also being violated. So this kind of case will be heard by a court of appeals. Do you understand? Good. So, one other thing that you need to know about court of appeals or circuit courts, they are not trial courts. They are not trial courts. There is no jury. You don't have a jury of your peers. There are no witnesses. No new evidence is introduced. What exists is a panel of odd-numbered judges. Why odd-numbered? Because you do not want a tie. So a panel of odd-numbered judges it could be three, it could be five, it could be seven, it could be nine. It can go all up to 21, okay? A panel of odd-numbered judges. And there are lawyers from each side of the case. What do the lawyers do? Two things. Number one, the lawyers hold oral arguments with the judges. They hold oral arguments with the judges. Meaning, the judges ask them questions, and the lawyers answer these questions. You can listen to all our arguments if you want. They are available and open to the public. And second, the lawyers submit a legal document known as a brief, known as a brief, that outlines the constitutional issues involved in the case. Okay? Finally, the judges retire into their chambers and they deliberate. They discuss. Then they vote and they make a decision. When the judges make a decision, the winning side will accompany its decision with a written document known as an opinion. Known as an opinion. And the opinion outlines why the judges decided the way they did. All right? Now, that brings us to the top level of the three layers, the Supreme Court, as you can see it up here in red. Write it down. The Supreme Court is a court of original jurisdiction, 
it is the first to hear a case. Remember, I outlined for you last time which cases are heard first by the Supreme Court, original jurisdiction, and it is also a court of appellate jurisdiction. It hears cases upon appeal from a circuit court or a state supreme court. Okay? So it does both. The supreme court has a similar structure, similar structure to a court of appeals, a circuit court. The main difference is this. In the Supreme Court, the number of judges is fixed at nine. Fixed at nine. All right? Judges of the Supreme Court are usually the elites of their profession. They are usually white, usually male, very well incomed professionals who have been lawyers. Okay? Professionals who have been lawyers. Throughout the history of the court, there has only been two African-American judges. One of them, Thurgood Marshall, who passed away a long time ago. And the other one is currently serving Clarence Thomas, a George Herbert Walker Bush appointee. There have been five women, Sandra Day O'Connor, who retired, no longer a judge, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who recently died from pancreatic cancer, Sonia Sotomayor, an Obama appointee, and Elena Kagan, also an Obama appointee. And finally, the most recently appointed woman judge, Amy Barrett, a Trump appointee, a highly religious, highly conservative judge. There has only been one Hispanic, and that is Sonia Sotomayor, okay? And that's it. This is the diversity on your Supreme Court. There has not been an Asian American at all, nor a Native American at all. Finally, before I wrap this up, find out on your own about the following. What is judicial activism? What is judicial restraint? What is original intent? All right. And so we come to the end of the class. Um, as I remind you, this is the final lecture, no more lectures. The exam, the final is not cumulative. It only covers what we have covered since the last exam. That's it. And uh, on this note, one last time, I will say bye-bye.